Please welcome to the stage, Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Richard Cordray, and Harvard University Senior Fellow and CEO of Barefoot Innovation Group, Joanne Barefoot. So I'm gonna go here? Yes. Over. I think I got the theme song there. Thank you. It's exciting to be here at Money 2020 and see all the intense interest around innovation and consumer financial services. The possibilities opened up by powerful technologies and novel approaches are enabling new services and transforming how payments and lending are conducted. So we want to understand how we can influence and channel this wave in positive directions. And I believe our goals are the same, to put consumers first and improve their lives. As many of you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is now the one federal agency with the sole mission of protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. We're working to see that all consumers have access to consumer financial products and services in markets that are fair, transparent, and competitive. Unlike the other regulators, we have authority over both banks and non-bank financial companies, which means we can oversee the entire marketplace, regardless of institutional type, to protect consumers. Among our statutory objectives, we're expressly directed, and this is odd, to ensure that these markets operate transparently and efficiently to facilitate access and innovation. We're thinking hard about how we as a federal regulatory agency can help fulfill this objective. And we've come to believe that FinTech can help provide people with more value and better service, as well as the fairness and protection that the law requires. Many novel products that fintech companies and financial institutions are developing cut across existing regulatory frameworks. That raises challenging issues for all of us. Certainly, we need to make sure that all players in the marketplace comply with existing law, whether they are new innovators or long-standing institutions. Notably, the same technology that empowers consumers to make decisions that serve their interests can also be used to steer them in ways that benefit others at their expense. Yet we recognize that evolving technologies hold great promise. So we will continue to work through these issues and encourage innovation that drives the financial system to deliver even more value to consumers. You no doubt have noticed that we've taken several enforcement actions now against fintech providers. These should not be misread or overread. Everyone who provides consumers with financial products and services must adhere to the same standards and will be held to the same expectations. But we're not looking to punish anyone merely for raising novel issues that present unsettled points of law or questions that fall into unforeseen cracks in the regulatory framework. Instead, our enforcement actions to date have addressed basic meat and potatoes issues, such as companies that promise one thing to their customers and then do something quite different. That is deceptive conduct, and nobody has any privilege to engage in such conduct without putting themselves in legal peril. To help facilitate access and innovation, the Consumer Bureau launched Project Catalyst four years ago. Back then, this initiative was, an, was a novelty for a banking regulator, both here and around the world. We have since had many discussions with our counterparts in Europe and elsewhere, and we share a growing enthusiasm for finding ways to leapfrog forward to products that are more accessible, more affordable, more convenient, and more empowering of consumers. From the start, Project Catalyst has concentrated on encouraging marketplace innovation so that new products can be made safe for consumers. We see new developments in payments, transactions, lending, underwriting, budgeting, money management, and other areas as well. That is a staggering list, even a revolutionary list of areas ripe for change to benefit consumers. Let us focus for a moment on access. For many years, millions of American households have been unbanked, consigned to live in the cash economy where the task of managing the ways and means of their lives almost always costs more, takes longer, risks more, and does less to build their financial futures than is true for most consumers. Tens of millions more are credit invisible in that they lack a credit record or have credit reports too thin to generate a credit score. Others have scores that classify them as subprime borrowers. A large number of these underserved consumers are hardworking people, living paycheck to paycheck, and waging a constant and careful struggle to make ends meet. 
Some of the most exciting and consumer-friendly innovations bring new products to those who have been locked out or underserved, whether or not they join the banking system. General purpose reloadable prepaid cards and new forms of prepaid accounts are providing the functionality to address people's fundamental financial needs. So it is no longer the case that being locked out of the banking system leaves people bereft of any satisfactory options. New technologies can also open up new credit opportunities and more efficient ways to manage money and control spending. We see mobile technology and innovations in distribution making cost-effective financial services available in both urban and rural environments where traditional brick-and-mortar outlets may be uneconomical. Computer-enabled data mining can lead to better understanding the financial patterns of the underserved, their inflows and outflows, and how they find ways to manage their gaps. This approach could open up opportunities to fashion brighter futures that benefit not only them, but the rest of us as well, thereby strengthening our economy as a whole. But even beyond approved access, creative new tools can help working families better manage their finances. Newly pro new product designs are empowering households to, do be to better anticipate and weather the inevitable income and expense shocks they face in an uncertain economy. Along with the innovations that are starting to emerge from traditional account providers, we're now clear in our minds that many of these beneficial products will be fintech products. What we call our project catalyst encompasses approaches that are frankly experimental. Like you, we're seeking to innovate around our mission. We know we do not have all the answers, so we're determined to try things and learn from our growing body of experience. We're seeking insights from research pilots with both startup firms and larger companies, as we did with a recent project exploring a savings vehicle on a prepaid product with American Express. Other research projects are currently in the works. Among the products that interest us are tools to help people better manage their finances and automatic or motivational savings tools that help them build rainy day funds for emergencies. We're also interested in services that help consumers smooth volatile incomes, avoid overdrafts, or reduce reliance on expensive short-term credit. Through our office hours program, we engage with hundreds of companies, large and small, on the front lines of innovation. It helps us learn while spreading awareness of the CFPB and our philosophy on encouraging financial innovation. We will release our first report on Project Catalyst tomorrow, highlighting some of the insights we have gained so far. Another way we seek to facilitate consumer-friendly innovation is through our no-action letter policy. We recognize that companies may be uncertain about how existing regulations apply to novel products that do not fit neatly within the regulatory structure. Under our no-action letter policy, if CFPB staff is persuaded that a particular product holds promise for consumers and is structured in a way to mitigate risk to consumers, but is held back by regulatory uncertainty, the staff can issue a no-action letter to the company stating that we have no intention to initiate supervisory enforcement action based on those particular innovations for a defined period. For example, and this is an important example, we met with a number of innovators that seek to expand access to credit by looking to alternative forms of data and newer methods, such as machine learning, of analyzing the data to assess credit worthiness. They say they want to do this in compliance with the consumer financial laws, including the fair lending laws, but are unsure exactly how to do so. Through Project Catalyst program, bureau staff can I consider issuing a no action letter to foster access and innovation. We welcome a dialogue with anyone who's facing this sort of challenge, as we know some of you are, in expanding access to credit. Another way Project Catalyst can help innovators better serve consumers is through our trial disclosure waiver policy. Throughout the financial marketplace, disclosures must be provided when a consumer shops for or purchases a product, and often on a periodic basis over the life of an account. These required disclosures are designed to help consumers understand the terms of the product. But in today's world of fast-changing technology, there may be opportunities to deliver disclosures more effectively than by traditional static forms. Congress authorized the CFPB to provide greater latitude for companies to test alternatives to standard disclosures over time. Again, we welcome dialogue with anyone interested in doing so. Many exciting products we see through the lens of Project Catalyst are dependent on consumers having given permission for companies to access their financial data from financial providers with whom the consumer does business. 
We recognize that such access can raise various issues, but we are gravely concerned by reports that some financial institutions are looking for ways to limit or even shut off access to financial data rather than exploring ways to make sure that such access, once granted, is safe and secure. Let me state the matter as clearly as I can here. We believe consumers should be able to access this information and give their permission for third-party companies to access this information as well. In the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress likewise stated that subject to regulations issued by the Bureau, consumers should be able to access information maintained by a financial provider about the consumer's use of their products. Congress also specified that the information shall be made available in an electronic form usable by consumers. We look forward to productive engagement with all stakeholders on this topic to find solutions that put consumer interests first. The Consumer Bureau is still a new agency with our, with our sights set firmly on the future. We're not content to sit passively by as mere spectators watching these technologies develop. Instead, we intend to move forward alongside the industry, keeping an eye out to protect consumers, even as we encourage innovative providers to put consumers first and find ways to make their lives better. Likewise, most fintech companies understand that your long-term interests depend on providing great value and service to consumers. In these ways, our deepest interests are closely aligned. It is within our reach here to change the world and make it vastly better for consumers. Let's do that together. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. It's great to have you on this stage uh, coming from the perspective of a regulator. I don't think there's any sector that is as pervasively and complexly regulated as financial services with the possible exception of medicine. And I think you can make the argument that the CFPB is the single most important regulator for the people in this room with the scope that you have and the mission that you have touches practically everything here. So to start out, what would you like this audience to understand about the CFPB when they're wearing their hats as innovators? I think there's two main points that I tried to convey, but I'll try to reinforce here. The first is that we do insist that every provider in this marketplace, whether old or young, uh, longstanding or, or novel, needs to understand that there are basic requirements of the law that they have to meet, and they have to understand that. It has to be part of their uh, DNA from the get-go, and that they need to think carefully about putting the interests of the consumer first. Now, I think that that is part of the philosophy that's motivating and animating a lot of fintech providers, and that's what we see as we talk to them in our office hours uh, uh, meetings. Uh, but the second point I want to make is that when you see the word protection, in the name of our agency, you also see the word consumer. And for consumers, one thing we understand is, in addition to being protected, they need to be supported. I think as an agency, we, we're in a position to do a better job to stop people from doing bad things to people. We're not in as much position to encourage people to do better things for people. And it's, it's people who create innovative products and think about how to meet consumer needs or to meet them better or to iterate their products differently or to transform their products in ways not before conceived by others. They're going to provide a lot of value to consumers. It's going to open up a lot of opportunity for consumers. And these are things that we are very welcoming of and very interested in and very attentive to. And we see it as part of our mission to help facilitate and foster that kind of innovation. So when you think about consumer-friendly innovation from the perspective of a regulator, what are you looking for? What are the characteristics of consumer-friendly innovation as opposed to innovation for its own sake? Well, there are actually a lot of things, and there are a lot of things we see in some of the different subsets of, of fintech uh, products. W one is access, m greater consumer access, so that, so that people have uh, the, the opportunity to uh, better manage their, their financial lives. Uh, 
And, and as I said, there's significant numbers of people who've been shut out of our system, even though they have significant inflows and outflows. Uh, and if we can figure out how better to include them, they're going to they're gonna have a better chance of success in their lives. Uh, but there's lots of things that go on, on top of that. There is uh, creating greater access to credit. There is helping them control spending uh, and and create savings opportunities so that they can be in a better position to provide for their own futures, whether long-term or short-term. Even if it's just getting ahead of what otherwise would become a payday loan, that can be a very significant difference in people's lives. There are a lot of specific products where we see tremendous uh, opportunities opening up. Uh, better pr products that are refinancing student loans and giving people uh, a better uh, opportunity to deal with what is a crushing burden for a lot of our young people. Uh, Peer-to-peer -peer and person-to-person and -person money transfers, both domestically and internationally, reducing the cost of that, making that you know, highly affordable. And what's more important is not just affordable in terms of dollars, but affordable in terms of time, making it convenient for people so that it's easy for them uh, to do that. You know, these, these are important things that, that we're looking, to, looking for and that we're learning about, again, through our office hours uh, uh, project around the country. By the way, we're going to have our last office hours session for this year on October 31st, which is a week from Monday in San Francisco. Uh, and we would encourage people to reach out to us who want to uh, be part of that. And we'll be back around again, of course, uh, next year. So as a former regulator myself, I think the regulators have the hardest job in the whole system here because they're the ones who have to walk the knife's edge on this, allow good innovation to happen, and block ha harm. And sometimes they're intertwined. The, you know, the good and the bad are, are mixed together in the same products and um, without much leeway. And we've entered an era where, you, you know, we, we know each other. I've spent most of my career working with consumer protection and inclusion. And uh, we've suddenly come into a time when the technology potentially makes it possible to accomplish things we've been trying to accomplish through regulation for decades and now can see a whole new flowering of opportunity on both protection and inclusion if the regulators get it right. So talk some more about what you think are the most promising trends that are emerging, the things that you think have the greatest uh, potential or are most ripe for desirable innovation? Well, so, so I'd say you know, there's, there's several things in, in your question. The first is I do think we're at a peculiar time right now, a, a special time and a very promising time where people are aggressively rethinking old methods and they understand that it's possible to knock down some of these barriers and walls uh, to the financial system. Uh, and I think that the established institutions are, they're recognizing that this is happening and they're being pushed and competed and stimulated to change as well. So you know, if you think of it in terms of Joseph Schumpeter, waves of creative destruction, uh, I think we have a wave of creative progress that's, that we're on the tip of here, and there are real opportunities across a variety of spectrums here. I mean, when we, when we categorize FinTech, we see five or six or seven different subcategories here, each of which holds significant promise to, to remake uh, lending, to remake payments, to, to remake uh, credit, credit reporting, to remake underwriting. You know, as I said, the, the list of things is, is pretty staggering, pretty fast in terms of how much may be redone. But there is a responsibility on the regulators, as you say. We have, a, we have an unfortunately somewhat fragmented regulatory system. I think that's hard for innovators to start to work through. You have to, you have to push through a lot of obstacles, some of which may not make a lot of sense to people because they're based on sort of historical developments. And, and you know, it, as, as we've discussed, I'm new to this just the last few years. I don't understand all of those historical reasons for things that may or may not make sense to me as much as they even make sense to some some innovator who just has an idea and simply wants to try to follow it uh, through. But I think the regulators are recognizing we need to think more carefully about what we're doing. We can't simply greet every new opportunity by saying, 
we don't know, we aren't sure, and therefore people go away and they're, they're left with no better guidance than before. That's why we've tried to create this no action letter policy and this trial waiver disclosure policy. It will only be as good as if people come to us and make use of it and turn it into something. Uh, again, I can't, I'm not in a position to create new products and throw them out there for consumers. That's what this sector is going to do. We can help guide it, we can help push, push it in the right direction. We need to make sure that it is consumer friendly and consumer centric. Uh, those are all part and parcel of it. I also think each of us as regulators has a, has a responsibility to work with one another and create a kind of common path forward so that people aren't gonna be buffeted by this regulator says X and this one says not X and this one says I'm not sure and you just don't know where to go in terms of trying to do the basic thing of serving your customer better, which is, which is what it's all about. And uh, again, we see that we think we're on the verge of some real breakthroughs here, uh, some real opportunities. Some of them are transformative. Some of them are simply doing certain things quite a bit better. Uh, and we as regulators need to think about how we can do things quite a bit better in return. Your comments on the interagency challenge are uh, music to the ears, to, I think, to hear the regulatory appreciation of that because it's a massive challenge for innovators to try to navigate, even to understand the uh, regulations and regulators that apply to them, not to mention figure out how to, how to navigate. I don't know if it's way. music to ears. It may be too much music and dissonant <laughs> and discordant music, but uh, that's part of our job is to try to work through that. And, and frankly, part of our job is to listen carefully to the folks who are doing the innovating and try to understand what the obstacles are that they're running into that we may or may not intend, we may or may not want, uh, and we may be able to remove. But I think it requires a lot of communication back and forth. And you know that's why we're, we're inter interacting now with hundreds of companies uh, and welcoming their thoughts about what challenges they're finding. We want them to be able to do better things for customers. And there are a lot of opportunities here. Uh, but if we're in the way, uh, and, if, and if that's part of their problem, then we should have frank discussions around that and see what we can do to alleviate that. I think the regulatory uncertainty is part of it, that people aren't sure whether one regular might, regulator might view something one way and another might view it another way. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do that when we have, I think we have five direct regulators that uh, and there's different levels of government as well, as you know. Yes. At the federal level, yep. plus the states, plus yep. I counted up about two dozen other federal agencies that get involved with consumer mm -hmm. financial mm -hmm. topics, so it's a lot. Uh, but as you say, the transformation is incredible. I mean, the cell phone alone, it seems to me, is the most democratizing force in the history of finance. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. People that no one would ever have built a branch for now can have a basically a, mm -hmm. a bank in their phone everywhere yep. in the world. Yeah, yep. it's and democratizing and it's powerful. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the CFPB itself uh, has been kind of a startup. It's the first agency in memory, for me at least, that uh, started from scratch, didn't, isn't an amalgamation of older agencies, but rather started with a blank mm -hmm. sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the ways in which the CFPB is trying to be innovative itself. So I think the fact that we're new and brand new, as you say, and by the way, it's, it's a painful thing <laughs> in the federal government to take something and start it from zero and build it into something and try to do it quickly. And we've had our share of growing pains that, that uh, uh, certainly I would acknowledge. You just had your five-year so. five birthday. Yeah, just, just, just five years in and, and now about, uh, about 1,600 people. So I would say several things that I think it means for us uh, attitudinally and, and, and uh, experientially. Number one, because we're brand new, we're not, um, we're not, we're, we're able to think about things, you know, for the first time and try to figure out what's the best way to do them. And, and that's something that has been arduous for us because thinking everything through from sort of first principles is, is not easy and, and it isn't always all that productive. 
uh, and yet we've had that opportunity. But the second thing is because we're new and because we haven't been at it very long, I think we have a lot less pride of authorship than a lot of established uh, government organizations do. And if we start down a road and we find that we're getting it somewhat wrong or it's not working out like we expected, we're not reluctant to change course, to, to rethink, to take the input that we're getting. Uh, and and we've, we've done revisions to rules, even though those rules are fairly new, uh, in the mortgage market, remittances, elsewhere. Uh, and we will continue to, I think, have that spirit for quite some time to come, I hope forever, uh, but uh, certainly for some time to come. Then in our own um, approaches to things, I think we've been able to and open to, we haven't had legacy technology, so we've been able to do it from scratch. So for example, our consumer complaint uh, databases is something really new and different in government, certainly in financial services, which is that we've now taken, I think we've, we've now taken in excess of a million complaints. Uh, we make those publicly accessible and, and available through an API. Uh, people can search those themselves, sort them, filter them, uh, look at them by uh, all kinds of different uh, fields and, and download the data the ways they want. And then they find patterns in them that we may or may not have seen ourselves. We also are doing our own natural language uh, processing and, and analytic methods on our, on our complaints to figure out what we can determine we should prioritize in our work. But I think we're trying to do a lot of the things using, using the data the way I think uh, we're interested in seeing that the private sector doing as well. And one of the things we've encouraged and, and strongly urged about compliance in these companies is they get a lot more data than we get because they get complaints directly from their customers and they should be digging into the patterns. You should be trying to see what the gap is between what your intentions are and what the actual execution is for customers as told to you from the voice of customers. That is quite important. We've, we've developed an e-regulations tool that makes the whole corpus, and you know it's a significant corpus of federal regulatory uh, law and rules, uh, readily available, searchable, and, and more, uh, more, more usable by consumers and industry alike. People have liked that. We've been developing a lot of web-based tools around consumer information, engagement, education, uh, whether it's in the mortgage market or the auto market or paying for college, all these things. Those are freely available. People can use them, adapt them, uh, use them in, in your own businesses. It's good information. It's our best neutral information. Uh, and it sort of has the CFP brand on it, but you can use it. And, and uh, there's no, that, that's what it's for, frankly. Uh, and we are, we are doing some targeted search advertising to try to boost awareness of our tools and resources, which is, uh, again, not an easy thing. I'm sure that 50 years from now, people will become very familiar with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I would like to think so. The question is how we can get from now to then faster and, and uh, in a more um, uh, comprehensive way. You've also made the home mortgage Disclosure Act data available through APIs as well. You've we, done a we are, lot. We are doing that, yes. Data mm. accessibility. I was especially interested in your comments about uh, taking on the whole issue of customer data uh, con access the, mm -hmm. for consumers to give permission. Yeah, th to this, this is this is this is an ongoing struggle, uh, I think, out there, and and we're concerned about it because we do think that uh, consumers should have priority over their own information. We see that in the credit reporting business as well, where much of that information consumers really were unaware of and, and, and pretty ignorant about, and they weren't, they weren't tending to it, weren't paying attention to it, weren't getting errors corrected, and those processes were a lot more difficult than they should be. Uh, all of that is changing now. This needs to change. It's important that it change. Uh, and, and I would also uh, urge again on the alternative underwriting uh, alternative approaches to underwriting, there is no reason to think that hi the historic um, so somewhat accidental development of assessments of credit worthiness, which are around definitions with a historic cast or data that sort of grew up in sort of sort of willy-nilly, but not in, a, not in a way that you would do it a priori, uh, that those are the best approaches to credit worthiness. And if we can develop better ones that give more people a sense, uh, a, a, a more accurate sense of people's credit worthiness and a more complete sense of it, again, people who have significant inflows and outflows in their lives, they may not just qualify in the definition of credit, uh, and we can do a better job of that, then, then that could unlock a lot of potential. And so if people are being held back in part by regulatory uncertainty in that area, uh, we want them to 
come talk to us and figure out how we can work through this uh, in a way that unlocks that potential because we think there's enormous potential there. That's so important. The data, it seems to me, are the circulatory system for innovation, the life's blood of practically everything people are doing. So I, it's great that you're focusing on it. We only have a moment or two left. Um, you mentioned that the, uh, the your, your key advice seems to be from the, your remarks earlier that uh, innovators need to have compliance in their DNA. Do you have any other advice for the people in this room about how best to uh, build their businesses in ways that are going to going to thrive, including on the regulatory front? I, I just think that um, anybody who's looking to build a business over the long term, and and this used to be much more fundamental to the business philosophy. I think quarterly earnings have have undermined it to some degree. Uh, you build a business over the long term based on customer satisfaction. And people want to come back and do more business with you and spread the word to others because they're so delighted and, and pleased with the value they're getting from you and the service that they're getting from you. And if you, f if you focus on that, and I think a lot of fintech providers that I've seen are focused on that, uh, that's, that's going to be a much better world for consumers. And it's going to be a world that will make the job of regulators of trying to you know, halt some of these bad practices and some of these, you know, con very unfriendly consumer practices, it, it should make our job a lot easier. Uh, and, you know, as we all catch up with technology, it's a hard world in which there's so much change. But we don't have the luxury of, of having a different world. This is going to be our world for this generation and for some time to come where there's going to be rapid pace of change, uh, a lot of things people are going to have to keep up with, and a lot, of, a lot of opportunity to go here, go there. Put the consumer first, put their interests first, think about how you would, you would serve people in your family with these products, and, and I think that the sky's the limit for what we can do over the next uh, next few years. I think there are real opportunities to remake significant parts of the financial system uh, in very consumer-friendly ways. Rich Cordray, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it so much.